пленарное заседание. Доктор Младчик Винсент Ивансо. Тема доклада «Случайные темы». Добрый день. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to, to visit Samara and this uh, conference. My title is uh, Random Tensors, but I will uh, really talk, I think it's a subject which could have many applications in, uh, in the next uh, years or decades, but I will talk only on one, uh, one reason I, I am interested in the subject, which is the riddle of uh, quantizing gravity. So that's really my talk is really about random tensors as a tool towards quantizing gravity. Well, uh, it's really a very ambitious uh, subject. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a, a selfie snapshot of the universe. <laughs> we photographed the, the universe and the universe looks like this. So you see, uh, it is inhomogeneous on a certain very big scale. This is a Planck satellite uh, sky map of the primordial radiation which occurred just just after uh, you know the Big Bang cooled and uh, and the uh, photons uh, got separated from the electrons uh, 200,000 years after the Big Bang. Well, uh, what do we see? We see that the universe is. Uh, not exactly homogeneous, which is very interesting. Uh, but uh, the, perhaps the first thing we, we should know about the universe, and we should wonder, is that it is very big. You know, uh, this is also reflected in the very uh, smallness of this parameter called the cosmological constant. So the, the universe is very big. Uh, very big relative to what? There is a single length in the universe which is sort of universal given by the constants of physics. And this length is uh, very, very small. If you like, in meters it's around 10 to the minus 33 or something like that. So the universe is at least uh, 10 to the 27 or 28 uh, meters uh, in observable radius. After that we don't know. So we know that the universe is at least uh, 10 to the 60 or 70 or I think 60, 70 or 80 times the Planck length. So this is a huge number. So why is it that uh, this, our universe is so, so big? Well, we don't know. Maybe uh, one clue is to understand how the Big Bang occurred. And for this, we seem to have a problem, which is uh, quantizing gravity. So, quantizing gravity uh, has been considered sometimes the most fundamental unsolved issues of physics that was, uh, you know, that the 20th century couldn't solve and gave us to solve in the 21st century. Well, uh, I will review several, not all, but several approaches to this problem. And I, uh, I will then uh, introduce the idea of using random tensors. So my starting point towards quantization of gravity uh, would be a Feynman quantization prescription. Uh, in that prescription, uh, it's not so much, it's really adapted to field theory in the sense that instead of having a time, a Hamiltonian and a Hilbert space, which of course are very interesting point of view on quantization, uh, one can see quanti quantization as a functional integral. Uh, it's a kind of probability measure, but not exactly probability measure because it has a sign. You know, there are interferences, as was explained by Professor Volovich. Then, if we apply this idea to quantizing gravity, uh, we could say it's a, about like randomizing geometry because the, you know, the partition function, the functional integral, which should make sense is, you know, because uh, gravity by Einstein theory is intimately related to the geometry of space-time, we should quantize this geometry of space-time. That is, we should try to sum over all possible metrics and the, the weight uh, for Feynman functional integral is this exponential of the action. So we know in general relativity the action is called Einstein-Hilbert action, is a function of the metric. And we should sum over the space, this action, and we should try to sum over the matrix. So there is a sum over matrix and a sum eventually over space. 
And the problem is we don't know to do these sums. We don't know what is the measure we should use to sum out of a metric. We don't know uh, what we should take as space-time, because we don't know the shape of space-time at infinity and so on, and even at very small uh, size. A very important debate in the experts is, should one sum over the topology of the space? You know, the space can be like R4, it can be contractible, it can be a sphere, or it could have maybe handles that are so tiny that we don't see them, or very so big that we also don't see them. Uh, some people think we should not. Uh, I think we should because some, uh, usually if we don't include all the right uh, possibilities in this sum, then the, the punition is that we don't get a unitary theory or uh, probability amplitudes don't add up to one. Well, the question is how do we put sources for observables? Sometimes people say it's impossible because observing uh, would be like creating another universe, you know, and trying to have, uh, we cannot observe universe like we observe particles in the particle accelerator. But still, uh, this is just a partition function and we should also have a theory for observables. And uh, then uh, the question is, this quantum theory in a certain limit should reduce to our classical uh, theory of general relativity. So, why is it that it is so difficult to <coughs> put together all these constraints? Well, uh, there are many problems, many questions. For instance, should we use a theory which does not depend on the particular space-time invariant? Uh, it's difficult to have uh, an interpretation of time in quantum gravity. There are specific problems. There is this question of topology change. Maybe we need extended objects, I will say a word about things later, uh, to quantize gravity. Maybe we need uh, new symmetries like supersymmetry. But the, for me, if we return to the main problem, why is it that 20th century was not completely able to agree on a solution of quantizing gravity? Probably the main problem is because uh, the usual recipe that works for over interactions, quantum field theory with renormalization, doesn't work. You know, it, when you have many particles and uh, a system with many degrees of freedom to quantize, then, or in, in the limit of infinitely many degrees of freedom, you, you get a formalism, quantum theory has infinities, you know, unknown infinities. And then there was a solution, uh, in particular here in Russia, uh, it was uh, Bogolyubov who gave us recipes. And uh, we know that in some cases, like the usual theories of particles that that, that work for electromagnetic and weak and strong interactions, then uh, the theory uh, using R4 space-time is perturbatively renormalizable. That is, you can get rid of the infinities in the computation. But the main problem, perhaps, of quantizing gravity is that if you take the same uh, approach, may, you fix a certain space-time, and you try to uh, you know, consider, for instance, a flat metric, and you, you write a small perturbation of this, and you try to, 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 um, to consider the Einstein-Hilbert action in the same way as you do for ordinary field theory, it, doesn't, uh, it is not perturbatively renormalizable. Okay. Uh, why, after all, is this so important? I think this is very, very important because Progressively, we understood that renormalization is not just about removing infinities. It's a bit deeper than that. It's a bit like thermodynamic limit. Uh, if you cannot do a thermodynamic limit uh, in statistical mechanics, it's very difficult to have a nice understanding of large systems. So uh, I would like to, to pay uh, some, some tribute to, uh, to the idea of the renormalization group, which is a kind of extension of renormalization. You know, uh, for a while, the physicists, they thought, okay, renormalizing is like you, you have infinities and you push them under the rope, <laughs> like this, this cleaning lady is doing here. So this is a joke. Uh, well, it's more than that. Um, it's, uh, and I will pay tribute to uh, Ken Wilson because he, he died la last year. So he uh, and others, they understood better that uh, renormalization is not just about suppressing infinities. It's really about understanding how uh, physical law change when you change the resolution power of your instruments. We also call it the observation scale. You know, if you look at nature with a microscope and then with a uh, more powerful uh, microscope and so on until a particle accelerator, you will see different 
you know, different behaviors. And uh, you can connect these behaviors by saying that if you have an action for a theory, if you integrate so-called uh, fluctuation fields, which represents the degrees that are so small that you cannot observe them, you get an effective theory for the degrees of freedom that you can observe, which is slightly different because of this integration conditional, if you like, expectation value. And uh, uh, Wilson uh, was able to make a powerful analogy between this change of the law of physics and the flow of a dynamical system in which the change of scale is the same as the change of time for a dynamical system. So this is called the renormalization group. And also, he, he could get a very nice explanation of why uh, the theories of physics, like electromagnetism, electroweak interactions, strong interactions, why they are given by uh, so-called just renormalizable uh, theories. Well, it's probably because uh, when you have a just renormalizable interaction, uh, this flow is, it, it is very, very slow for the couple constant. So the it doesn't hit very fast uh, phase transition, and presumably you can have you know laws of physics that, that are the same over many scales, and then you that that, that is a little bit like uh, like a kind of Darwinian uh, process, you know, the just renormalizable interactions they survive long flows, so it's no surprise that after all physics is described by them. So in this way, uh, ideally we would like. That quantum gravity is also like that, that it should be uh, renormalizable and understandable in terms of renormalization group. But we have this problem that uh, the naive formulation is not. So many, many things have been tried to solve the problem, and uh, some of them are more convincing than others, but there is no total consensus yet. So I am now going to... to uh, to tell you about several approaches. I realize that some approaches are more known than others in Russia, so I will try to, 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 to give a, a balanced picture. There is one absolutely main approach, which is um, extremely interesting mathematically, and which has been, I would say, leading or dominant during the last 30 years. It is an approach uh, which uh, went from uh, supergravity to, to strings and superstrings. It is an approach which is uh, like trying to extend the recipes which worked well for, for particle physics, for instance, adding more symmetries and trying to, uh, to build on uh, some of the ideas that was, were also developed to understand strong interactions. So, I, well, there are some names here, but there are many, many, many people. Uh, the, the main idea is that the particles should be, uh, of, of particle physics should be vibrating modes of extended objects called strings. And then uh, the theory of strings is not so easy to work out and has some inconsistency if you don't add up supersymmetry. But supersymmetry is a postulate that every bosonic particle has a fermionic partner. And then uh, the nice thing is that uh, in a sense, because you have so much symmetries and because the particles are extended, uh, it's not exactly that the theory is renormalizable, but it's sort of like the, it is ultraviolet finite, or you could say that the ultraviolet problem is, is mixed with a large distance problem, and, uh, well, although there is uh, no complete mathematical theorems, uh, it looks very much like the theory of predicts finite quantities at uh, any perturbation uh, order. Then it also is very ambitious because it's not just a t an attempt to quantize gravity. It's also an attempt to unify gravity with all of our interactions. It has been sometimes called uh, a, a tentative theory of everything. And the two main success of uh, uh, string theory in, in relationship with gravity is that uh, if you have these uh, this, this strings, you know, they can have uh, open ends or, or being like a close, like a, like a rubber, you know. And if you use the close things, then uh, you naturally have um, um, a particle called graviton in the massless spectrum of closed things. And also, the second big success with respect to quantizing gravity is that you could predict, you could give a counting explanation, a microscopic a la Boltzmann explanation 
for a semi-classical property of uh, general relativity, which is black hole evaporation and the formula for black hole entropy. What I view personally as the main problem of string theory is the following. It is uh, uh, required that uh, the strings propagate, if you like, uh, in a background which uh, could be complicated because instead of being R4, it should be, uh, it should be a, a ten dimensional and it could have a complicated shape. And uh, therefore, in fact, uh, super strings links leads to many models, at least, um, with respect to many different uh, so-called compactification or backgrounds and so on. And therefore, uh, in order to understand really why it could be natural and so on, we are led to try to uh, extend the, the super string theory into a a more general theory called M-theory, which should tell us which, which background is preferred or tell us how to make a coherent sum over these backgrounds. But unfortunately, this theory is still not well understood or well developed. And in particular, we do not have a simple action for this theory. We don't know what the action is. We have some tantalizing dualities or aspects which are understood, but fundamentally, we don't know yet what is the Lagrangian of the action of M-theory. Okay, so then I will uh, talk about a closely related approach. This M theory may be perhaps related to uh, so-called random matrix models. And uh, well, the idea that matrix models have to do with gravity uh, was particularly uh, advocated by these people, but it has a, a much longer history. It comes from the work of Toft and others and so on. So. To make the long story short, I would say that uh, I will talk again about matrix models in relation to tensor models. I would say that uh, essentially it's a good theory to quantize two dimensional gravity. But two dimensional gravity, if our space was two dimensional, gravity would be more, much, more, much simpler. It would be a topological theory and it would be uh, well represented by a kind of scaling limit of these matrix models. So in that case, uh, in fact, this theory of matrices uh, can sum over topologies, and we have some understanding of how this can be done. You know, topology in two dimensions would be, for instance, Riemann surfaces, they can have a certain number of handles, of course. And topology would be a sum over the number of handles by which you can take the surface. Well, in the recent decade, it has become clearer that these matrix models are also related to field theories. Uh, they are related to a subject called non-commutative quantum field theory. You know, matrices, when they multiply, their multiplication is non-commutative. So non-commutative quantum field theory is also a very interesting subject, which is really related to matrix models. And also, uh, uh, you know, there has been understanding how to put matter fields, uh, to couple matter fields with gravity in 2D, and this leads to very interesting Theories. Well, uh, the main problem is that it's, it's essentially a theory of 2D quantum gravity, so we need to go to higher dimension. Well, I will discuss uh, a, a third approach called asymptotic safety, which is a very conservative. The asymptotic safety approach was first proposed by Weinberg about uh, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then it was developed by a mathematician like a German, uh, Martin Reuter, and so on. What is it about? The idea is, okay, we take this R4 background, and the einstein hilbert action it is not renormalizable. But perhaps, if we were to add more terms, we could find what is called a non-trivial fixed point. That is a theory which is more complicated than the einstein hilbert action, but would be a uh, travelet uh, safe, would be... Uh, uh, fixed in the cabinet. So, in order to do that, uh, this approach is based on renormalization group, but uh, because we don't know the principles for, for searching for, for this uh, fixed point, uh, you have to explore with a computer a rather big so-called theory space. The theory space is, you don't take just the einstein hilbert action, which is a function of the metric, which is simple and diffeomorphic invariant, you take all diffeomorphic invariant functions, so you have a kind of classification of them. And because you cannot put them all in the computer, you take, you know, five or six uh, uh, terms, and you try to study whether, uh, by having a kind of integration on fluctuations, 
do you find a fixed point? Well, uh, the su main success is that you find a fixed point. Usually, the computer shows you generically a fixed point. Since more than 20 years or so, they have been refining their competition, so they find a fixed point. Well, for me, the main problem is that you, you don't have, by, 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 really by, by the method itself, you don't have any understanding of why this fixed point should be there. You, you really are a bit frustrated. And also, I don't like very much the idea that you fix this background and, for instance, there is no way you can change it. Well, uh, then I will list the fourth approach, which I call causal, uh, which is called causal dynamical triangulation. So in that approach, uh, it's a bit like an extension of uh, the idea that uh, space and time should be random and you should explore it via so-called uh, fusion rules for simple cells. Like, you know, uh, in two dimensions, if you want to pave uh, the ground, you could use squares or triangles like, uh, like this, uh, uh, this room. But uh, if you have a uh, uh, three dimension or four dimension, you, use, you should use tetrahedra or you know, chunks of volumes, which have volume, and you can glue them, and you should try to find gluing rules. And this approach has been developed by for instance, these people. Uh, they found, uh, then, uh, they tested gluing rules with computers, and they, their goal was to find <coughs> uh, gluing rules which would, uh, in which when uh, you glue many, many cells, the final shape of the object you get, statistically, would be like a ball or and they found it was not a ball, usually. So they added a condition. That's why it's called causal. They added a condition that there was a kind of preferred time. And then uh, the cells were organizing better as a ball. You know? So therefore, they put this global uh, condition that they interpreted as a causality condition. And then they found, again, numerically interesting extended phases. So, in my opinion, there is a bit the same problem as for the previous approach, namely you test this on a computer, but you don't understand really very well analytically why it works. Also, there's a problem of recovering this Lorentz invariance, and still no sum, because this condition prevents it, uh, usually have no sum over topologies because of this kind of, of condition that there is a preferred time. Well, uh, there is a fifth approach, and then I will stop. <laughs> a fifth approach is called uh, loop quantum gravity, and has been developed by, for instance, these people. So in that approach, the emphasis is on uh, the fact that one should try to find a Hamiltonian and a Hilbert space, which do, do not depend on any particular a priori space-time. That's why they call it background independent. That uh, this, uh, up to now, essentially, this theory uh, is more like a kind of first quantized formalism. And also, by hand, you put an uh, ultra finite cutoff, and this is not removed at any point. And there is an attempt to, in this language, to add a second quantization, and this is called group field theory. I, I find it interesting. But, uh, Main success, one of the main success of the theory is that indeed, because uh, of this finite cutoff, you can also find a right form of the black hole entropy, uh, but uh, it's not clear you can adjust the constant naturally to have the right constant. So it is not clear it's as good as what the string theory is doing. Well, I think uh, for me, in this approach, the main problem I see is that most of the approach still is at this level, not at this level. And in particular, uh, there is no clear action for this theory. And uh, I, don't see, uh, I, I don't see very well how to implement renormalization group in this language. OK, so <coughs> uh, there are still other proposals, but <laughs> I cannot review them all. So I will stop here. Just to tell you that uh, there is a, a, a landscape of ideas, it's very interesting. The main problem is we are going to have this landscape still for a while because it is difficult to experiment directly in the regime of quantum gravity. You know, uh, maybe we, we can have some indirect views that will favor this theory or that one if we discover some signs of supersymmetry 
it will favor super strings if we did, you know, but uh, even if we find some hints, we are not going to have, you know, direct critical experiments that we really choose. So I think for still a long time, we will have to develop what seems to us simplest and most mathematically coherent. And therefore, that's for a long time, I think, still a mathematical physics problem. So my uh, proposal uh, is to, uh, I, I called it, uh, I, I nicknamed it uh, tensor track, is uh, to try to generalize the second approach I told you about, the matrix approach, to higher than two dimensions by using a, a natural generalization of matrices. Uh, you know, matrix can be generalized as, uh, into a tensor, algebraically. And there has been recently a, a better theory of tensors created by this guy, Hans van Guro. So my proposal is to, to use this, this new theory of random tensors to try to, to, to apply it to this problem of quantum gravity. So I put it uh, here to show some relationship with other approaches, you know. So, for instance, in comparison with group field theory, the tensor theory, because you use these uh, actions which are well defined, it, uh, it will have the possibility of introducing renormalization. It, uh, the, this renormalization flows, it could be compared to these ones, but so it is a bit a proposal which tries to build quantum gravity out of a renormalization group. But uh, it is not the same space as asymptotic safety, because instead of having a fixed manifold and diffeomorphic uh, invariant actions, you will see that we have no manifolds, and we have a tensor symmetry, which is not diffeomorphism. So it is uh, also in a group, but not the same space. It is uh, directly an extension of this, because tensors you can see as extension of matrices. Yes. Would be, in that case, more than two. If the rank is one, I could call it a vector. If it is two, it is what I could call a matrix. And if it is more than two, then it would be. So the rank of the tensor would be uh, more than two if it's properly a tensor. And I will, I will uh, show you this a bit later. It will be related, at least naively, uh, the rank should be related to the space-time dimension. So if you want to model Gluing's rules for three dimension, you will use tensors of rank three for four dimension tensors of rank 4, but a priori, you could consider this theory at any rank. So I will tell you briefly what is this theory. And then, uh, if I compare it to this, uh, it is also a bit like this, because there will be gluing rules and so on, but it has an action, really an action which comes from a symmetry principle, which is not the case here. Also, uh, it is a background independent by construction, it sums over topologies, you will see by, that is one very interesting point, because topologies are much more complicated in, uh, in, in more than two dimensions. And this sentence really is the strong point of this approach, that it really sums over all topologies. In fact, it organizes topologies in a new way. And uh, also, a, a new result which I would like to emphasize strongly is that, just like there are some field theories associated there, which are the non-commutative field theory, there are some free theories there, and uh, surprisingly, they have this asymptotic freedom property. This was proved by Joseph Benjamin. Okay, so uh, now I will not be able to enter too much into the detail, but let me tell you a bit what kind of vision of universe, what kind of, 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 of uh, prejudices or hypotheses it has. So, you know, uh, in the quantum gravity phase, really what you would like to, this is like, the Big Bang, and this is a picture of the sky just after the Big Bang that I had at the beginning, and then it evolves into stars and galaxies and eventually our life here. But so if you like, uh, the, the, the theory of quantum gravity could be relevant to what happened before the Big Bang, or why the Big Bang occur, because somehow if the Big Bang is also the birth of time, you should perhaps not say before, you could perhaps say beyond. And it also would, have be, would be related to what we may see, perhaps, if we had sufficient energy packed in sufficient tiny volume to really probe the Planck scale. But I don't think we can do it without a, a giant a particle accelerator, which would be, you know, like uh, light like curves, beads, and so on. So it's, it's really a bit like a, a, a formal problem. So it, but it could have cosmological consequence. 
And it could have come consequence for particle physics because it probes a very tiny. Uh, so anyway, so in this view, uh, the Big Bang would would be like a con condensation of the theory that would would be beyond the Big Bang. And these tensor models also would describe the universe or the physics beyond the Big Bang. And also, I would like to to, to stress that the our initial studies led us to think that very probably. Uh, uh, we would go from this uh, theory to, to this one, not just in a single step, you know, uh, because many people want to quantize gravity just in a single step. It, it could be that you have a sequence of several phase transitions. For instance, when you go from a gas to a solid, like ice, you go through liquids. You know, so you, you, very, very often in physics you have many phase transitions. Okay. So in more mathematical terms, what is the hypothesis? So uh, the hypothesis of the tensor track would be that quantum gravity is, after all, a quantum field theory, but a quantum field theory of space-time, not on a particular space-time. So it requires a new way of, uh, of looking at the problem. So it should not depend on any preferred space-time background. And then uh, the space-time would be a concept which would emerge, you know, like a solid is not a fundamental concept, it is made out of uh, something else, you know, and there is a condensation which uh, allows it to emerge. So uh, we could say uh, that before or beyond the space time, there is a pre geometric phase of the universe. You could uh, imagine, for instance, if I have enough energy to concentrate into a Planck volume, you know, then uh, space time there would start to boil, you know. So instead of being uh, for instance, time, instead of being organized as a nice flow like the Volga River, you know, uh, it would become like a gas, or what? I don't know exactly what it could mean. But. So, because it would be so different from our usual way of thinking, we need a guiding thread. So my idea is that the renormalization group should be the guiding thread. We should try to find a notion of scale, which governs the flow of the renormalization group, even when there is no space-time. It was difficult. Because uh, the very idea of renormalization group was uh, related to space time. You should integrate what is short space time scale to get larger spatial, spatial uh, effects, space, space time effect. If there is no space time, what is the analog of smaller and larger? Well, we are going to give a proposal for that. It will be the size of the tensor, which will be the scale. And uh, as I said, uh, there is a kind of theory space for this phenomenon group, but it will not be dependent on any space-time. It will be an abstract space made of, I will show you what are these tensor invariant interactions. And it is certainly different from the one considered by Weinberg and the people of asymptotic safety. All right? Then let us continue. So uh, what is the conclusion if we have a quantum field theory of space-time? Why do we call it still a quantum field theory? Well, uh, in fact, because there is no space-time to begin with, what remains of the Feynman graphs and the theory of, of Feynman, of quantum field theory, what remains is combinatorics. The combinatorics, just uh, integers, counting structures, this does not depend on any space-time. And also graphs. If you think about graphs, graphs are binary relations between finite set of points. They don't depend on any space-time. So, uh, the graphs and the, their combinatorics certainly uh, uh, could be uh, the, the basics for a quantum field theory, which doesn't depend on any preferred space time at the beginning. Well, the interesting thing also to use graphs is that uh, if you have a graph, it is a kind of discretized version of space, which has no a priori on nothing, no a priori, not even on the space time dimension. But uh, uh, it is not only a space, it is a metric space, because as soon as you have a graph, you have a canonical notion of distance. To compute the distance between two points in a graph, you see how many links you need to go from one point to the other. So if you sum over graphs, a priori you sum over many shapes of spaces, but also with a metric. So it is well organized to give you directly a sum of the random metric space. But then you have to make, because this is the only thing you have, you have to make it very precise, because otherwise you know, can't have anything. So the idea is uh, to, to specify the way we would like to do this sum of the graphs, we should try to propose a symmetry principle. 
And this symmetry principle uh, is the following. Uh, we would like to, to consider, uh, you know, based on the success of vector models and matrix models to quantize 2D gravity, we would like to, to, to consider a field which has, many, which has many components. So it is a vector in a Hilbert space of, of, of big size. And then we would say that, uh, just like relativity principle was a good guide to find general relativity, we should try to find, to, to introduce an invariance under some symmetry. And a priori, we would like to, to find the most natural one, the, the, the simplest one. So for that, uh, let's analyze a bit how we go from a vector model into a matrix model. So I took here a pair of complex conjugate vectors. Using complex numbers is because it gives you some simplicity. It's not, you could use real numbers. But OK, so as what, is, what we call in physics a vector model is when you have a field and it's complex conjugate. And it has many components. And we ask that it is invariant under orthogonal change of basis in the Hilbert space, where, uh, which is C to the n. You see? So there is a simple theorem that tells you that functions which are invariant under uh, this rotation, uh, this change of basis, are functions of the scalar product. So the scalar product of phi and phi bar is just the sum over i of phi i of phi by i. And there is a theorem which tells you it's, it says this is the only so-called connected invariant of vectors. And uh, the actions which have these invariant principles are functions of the scalar product. How do you go from a vector to a matrix? Well, uh, one way you could see the going from a vector model to a matrix model is by breaking some invariance. Why? Because, you know, if you have a matrix, uh, a man by n matrix, it's uh, n square numbers. It's an array of n square numbers, n by n. So you, see, you have. But of course, this array you could also write as a, as a very long vector of size n square. So a matrix is a vector, but why do you call something a matrix rather than a vector? Just because you would consider an invariance which corresponds to change of basis here and here and not here. So it's the invariance which tells you that something is a matrix instead of being a vector. And it's a symmetry breaking. Why? Because having a uh, 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 an invariance in u of n is much smaller than u of n squared. This is a much bigger group than that one when n is large. So you have a smaller invariance and therefore because you have smaller invariants, you have more invariants. So you have more functions of the matrix coefficients, which are invariant under matrix invariants, than under uh, vector invariants. And we will see there is a, an infinite number of connected invariants for a matrix called the traces. Also, something which is true in both vector models and, and matrix models is that you have a so-called expansion of the model when the vector or the matrix gets large. And this is very important because this is a guiding expansion for 2D gravity. So how to generalize this to tensors? OK, so this was just uh, recalling this. I, I said, suppose that my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my number n uh, is the product of two integers, then uh, this would be a rectangular matrix n1 by n2, then instead of this big group, I ask for this smaller group, changing orthogonal basis here and here would be much smaller. Okay. And uh, the matrix models have therefore one connected invariant interaction at every even degree. If you consider trace of m m dagger to the power p for any integer p, this is an invariant under change of basis, both in the departure and arrival space of the matrix. So uh, previously, you know, we had only one invariant, which was a scalar product. Now we have infinitely many. This is because the symmetry is smaller. OK, so it's exactly the same idea that uh, Raspanguro used to define his theory of random tensors. And surprisingly, this idea was never considered before him. Very surprisingly, because it's a very natural one. It's just you say, OK. If you have an array of numbers now, so you have a vector, if you like, but uh, the number n is a product of many integers. So you have uh, an array which is not two-dimensional, but which is three or four or d-dimensional. Like, for instance, you can have a cube of numbers. Okay? 
So why is it that the cube of numbers, you, can see, you call it a tensor and not just a very big vector? Okay, it's because of a reduced symmetry. Instead of asking for uh, this uh, big symmetry U of n, where n is all this, you just ask for what are the interactions that are symmetric on the change of basis in the first vector space times change of basis in the second, etc., until the last one. So this is a, 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 a tensor product. So you, you ask for independent choices on, of basis in all the d directions of the array of numbers. Then you have much more invariance. And how do you classify this invariance? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to perhaps, uh, yes, I want to skip this because I want to go directly to uh, perhaps the classification of invariance. So maybe I will come back to this later. Yeah, I will come back to this later. Uh, I want to go to show you the invariance at this point, so I'm sorry. So let me show you the invariance at this point. Yes. So. Uh, I would like to show you what are the tensor invariants, that is, the polynomials of the coefficients of the tensor, which, which, which don't change when you make this independent change of basis. How are they described? Well, uh, they are described by, uh, uh, first of all, you can count them, and there are many more. So, you know, if you have a vector, that is, uh, you have the tensor of rank 1, you just have a scalar product, which is uh, homogeneous of degree 2, and you have no overconnected invariance. If you have a matrix, you have uh, this sequence of numbers. That is, you have the trace of m and m, m dagger, but you also have trace of m, m dagger, m, m dagger, and so on, and so on. So you have an invariant for each value of n. And you know this one is not the same as this one. This is a scalar product. This is not the square of the scalar product. Or it, is, you know, it is an independent function. So if you ask what are the polynomials which are invariant under, for instance, uh, change of variables, uh, 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 and, uh, if n, for instance, is a, if you have a vector uh, which is of a tensor of rank three, in fact, uh, then you will have more and more invariants when the degree of the polynomial uh, of the invariant grows. For instance, and this is for rank three. This is for rank four. So. You, you see, at second order, you still have only one invariant, which is a scalar product, always. But here, for instance, you have three, three, uh, three invariants instead of one, seven, 26, and so on. And here it grows even faster. So what it means is that the actions that are invariant under this principle, they are much richer, they, they are much bigger than the previous ones. Uh, and the, what indexes this thing? Well. These things are indexed by drawings called in mathematics regular dh colored bipartite graph. Okay, bipartite is because this is a complex theory with phi bar and phi. So bipartite means that you have vertices in the graph and they are either, either white or black. So a white dot is for a tensor and the black dot represents an anti tensor. Then uh, what means regular dh colored? Well, regular dh colored means that every vertex of the graph has a, a, a degree which is d. For instance, these are the, the three graphs. Uh, the, sorry, uh, these are the seven graphs. I will tell you why there are seven, although you don't see, you see only three at the moment. Uh, the seven graphs of order six for a theory of rank three. So because we have rank three, we have to, to have every ve vertex as coordination three. And also, they can be edge colored, that is, we can use three colors so that every vertex has one different uh, edge of a different color. So then we have to draw all possible different graphs. So why are there, for instance, seven graphs of rank free tensors which are invariant under this, uh, this symmetry? Well, uh, you have three of this type, three of this type, and one of this type. So one plus three plus three is seven. What are these ones? So you see, in these ones, uh, you have uh, this red line, red line, red line, and then blue and, and purple. So there are three of these because you see that the red line is special. It is the one which is not doubled. So it could be the red or the blue or the purple. So this graph, you have three types of such graphs. This graph, you have also three types, because you see, this is special, it is not at all this one. 
But you see, the line three is special because the line three is the only one which uh, which has this bar, which is a bit special in the graph. You see, the other ones uh, they are symmetric. So in fact, there are three of these. And finally, this one is neither this nor this. This is why there's this number seven. Whether here you have one and here you have zero. So you see clearly that when you look at actions, you have more and more complicated actions uh, when you have tensors than when you have matrices. Okay. Now, I should come back to uh, the previous step because I see my time is, uh, is, uh, is uh, going forward. So I would like now to tell you why is it, and this is a strong point of the theory, that this theory of tensors can organize some of our geometries in any dimension. So this is because uh, I have to go back to the question of, uh, of how to sum of our geometries. You know, there, when I was starting, I just started my, my career this year, and this was a, uh, there was a famous paper of Paul Yakov who had this, this beautiful sentence. In my opinion, at the present time, we have to develop an art of handling sums of uh, random surfaces. And in fact, uh, in the next 50, uh, 30 or so years, people have made enormous <laughs> pro progress along this idea of Polyakov and along string theory of how to handle some of our random surfaces. But still, we don't have the same, the same art for handling sums of our higher dimensional spaces. And the reason is it looks much more difficult. For instance, it is difficult to classify the geometries in dimension 4, you know, uh, so-called uniformization theorem is much harder. Here you classify by handles, for instance, the compact geometries, but here it's much more difficult. And uh, it is even some sort of impossible by finite algorithms to classify all smooth geometries in dimension 4. And um, even if we discretize the problem, for instance, we, we give you a general rule for gluing tetrahedra in dimension 3, or it is uh, very difficult to decide whether it is homeomorphic to the sphere of knots. It's a bit like a classifying knots. It's very difficult to know whether a knot is trivial or not. And it is even impossible to do that in 4D, so uh, for a single algorithm. So uh, it means that classifying geometry is difficult in higher dimension. And also, counting discretized geometry is more difficult, you know. If we look, for instance, at uh, counting trees or counting so-called planar graphs, which correspond to uh, specific geometry in 2D, then it can be done. For instance, uh, there is a famous result in 1962 by Tut. He counted the number of so-called routed planar quadrangulations with n faces. Uh, this is a routed planar quadrangulation, you see. The root is this uh, arrow that we put on one edge. And then why, why is it called a quadrangulation? Because every face is of length of four. This one is of length four because I count twice when I do this. Even the external one, by the way, is of length four. So this is a quadrangulation. So how many distinct beasts of this type do you have? Well, uh, Tut wrote an equation for it, and he solved it in 1962, and he found that this number is 3 to the n, 2 over n plus 2, 1 over n plus 1 to an n. So we could exactly ca count it, you know. And although this was much earlier than Polyakov and string theory, this is a bit one of the reasons, if you like, uh, of uh, the success, you know, in two dimensions, you can not only classify geometries, but within a particular geometry, like the plane, you can count the discretization. Exactly. So you have many, you know, exact functions. So uh, what is analog in more dimension uh, is completely unknown. For instance, uh, in more than three dimension, in three dimension, we don't even know whether the number of combinatorially distinct spavings of the free sphere with L tetrahedra is exponentially bounded in N or not. You know, this function is exponentially bounded in N. Because you have 3 to the N here, this is bounded by 1, and this is bounded by 2 to the 2N. So this is bounded by 12 to the N exponentially bounded in n. Is this true in more than uh, two dimensions? Well, we don't know. Uh, there, there are very limited uh, results. Uh, well, uh, we don't know. It's uh, still open question and very difficult. So maybe this is just because this is a wrong approach. So in fact, <laughs> with random tensor theory, we come up with a 
very ambitious idea that maybe it could be easier to quantize gravity than to count spherical triangulations. Why? Because in quantized gravity, remember, you should not count triangulations. You should ponder triangulations, but not with the same factor for every triangulation, because we should sort of ponder uh, the, the triangulation with taking into account the natural metrics that they carry, and there we should try to count them with the Einstein invert weight. The problem is, and it, 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 perhaps it hampered some progress, is that uh, in 2D, this, these are the same thing, because the Einstein invert weight in 2D is just a number of handles by the uh, you know, gauss body theorem. You, you know that integrating the curvature on the Riemann surface produces 2 minus 2G, so the Euler characteristic, which is uh, exactly a topology <laughs> design. This is no longer true in higher dimension. And so, uh, count, quantizing gravity is not the same as you know, counting with the same weight all spherical triangulations, but it is the same as pondering them with einstein invert weight. So then it is uh, possible to... The, the theory of Gouraud gave us a ray of hope because of the following thing. There is a 1 over n expansion in, 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 the, in, in, in the, the, the tensor invariance found by Gouraud, and this 1 over n expansion is exactly related to the discretization of the einstein hilbert action plus cosmological constant. So this was known, for instance, by Ambjorn and so on, uh, more than 10 years ago. It is known that if you, if you, uh, if you discretize a manifold via simplices and you don't add any other metric data, there is a natural so-called Regi action for this, which is the cosmological constant should be proportional to the number of simplices you use to pave your, uh, your, your space, because you know, if the simplices think of them being equilateral, they will have all the same volume. And then the curvature, which is the einstein hilbert term, would be proportional to the number of d minus 2 simplices, because curvature is a two form, so uh, because of this. And uh, then uh, the einstein hilbert action would simplify into a factor counting the number of d simplices and the factor counting the number of d minus 2 simplices in your triangulation. Now, there is a trick which is that in a matrix theory or tensor theory, the graphs are dual to the triangulations. And therefore, what was uh, dimension d becomes dimension uh, 0, and what was b dimension d minus 2 becomes dimension 2. So, the, for the dual graph, the einstein hilbert discretized action is simply <coughs> a constant for the number of vertices and the number n for the number of faces. So the rich action is just this. And that's precisely the factor you will get when you count uh, these uh, tensor invariant graphs. Okay. What is capital N? Yeah, so capital N would be the size of the tensor and little n would be the number of the vertices. And this would be the correspondence. Okay, so for this reason, uh, this theory of tensors is really related to the problem of quantizing gravity. Okay, how many time is it? Conclusion? No, no, time. no time. Okay, yeah. so then I will jump essentially to the conclusion. So uh, I will, uh, okay, so this was to talk about this regular DH color of the particle graphs. This was to show them. Uh, this I have no time to explain. It's just to show uh, what are the Feynman graphs of this theory. These are the vertices you had before, and these are the Feynman graphs of this theory. Okay. So my conclusion is the following. Uh, what have we learned so far? So uh, this tensor approach, it has naturally background independence, it has topology change, and it can accommodate renormalization. Well, uh, the flow is in terms of the size of the tensor. Okay, so it ponders the graph not with a uniform factor, but really to a factor which depends on the curvature and so the action. Uh, the one over n expansion is totally different from the one of string theory or matrix model. It is not of topological nature. Okay, so therefore it leads to a new program. Then uh, there, there has been some study of what called scalings and the study of renormalization in so called uh, associated field theories. And as I said, uh, a very interesting result is this asymptotic freedom design. So this concludes 
when I have to say on tensor models, and I have two advertisements to add. One advertisement is that if you want to, to learn further about this and uh, are going to be uh, in the Moscow area in two weeks from now, we have a conference called Quantum Geometry and Physics in which uh, some people will discuss further this, uh, this muscle theory. So uh, I, I, I will be a bit, I think, at an uh, 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 observer of it. We will be uh, the, the organizers. And then, uh, finally, another advertisement, if I may, is that the subject of combinatorics, random geometry, and physics being growing. Uh, this year, we have created also a new journal which is centered on this subject. So please, if you have a, a good uh, research paper on this, you can submit to this journal also. <laughs> this was. And uh, thank you for your.